Welcome back class to chapter 8, blood collection equipment and for venipuncture and capillary specimens lecture part 2. We will be talking about today is tourniquets. A tourniquet is a device that is applied or tied around a patient's arm prior to venipuncture to restrict blood flow. A properly applied tourniquet is tight enough to restrict venous flow out of the area but not so tight as to restrict arterial flow from that area. And the reason how you can tell if you tie the tourniquet too tight is when your patient's hand becomes a blue discoloration, it turns blue and it loses its color. That means the tourniquet is tied too tight and no arterial flow is going into the hand or into the arm itself. Restriction of blood flow can change blood composition if the tourniquet is left in place for more than one minute. So a tourniquet must, must fasten in a way that is easy to release with one hand during blood collection procedures or in an emergency situation as, as when a patient starts to faint or the needle accidentally backs out of the arm during a venipuncture. And that does happen. You try to pull the tube out and you pull it out too fast. Sometimes the needle will come out at the same time as the tube will come out itself. There are a number of different types of tourniquets and most are available in both adult as well as pediatric size. The first one we'll talk about is a pliable strap, which is basically a reusable tourniquet made of elastic material with a long band of Velcro or similar interlock material that allows a wide range of adjustment capabilities are also available. Then you have the Velcro, which I just talked about. Then you, you can also use your blood pressure cup as a sense of tourniquet. With a blood pressure cup, it can be used by just pumping it up to cut off circulation, well not to cut off, to slow down circulation for you to draw blood. There's only a, one problem with using a blood pressure cup is keeping it clean and disinfected if blood just happens to drop onto it. Or you go into a contaminated room. The next type of tourniquet that is available is called a seroskit. A seroskit is another type of tourniquet that is used in middle, like a miniature seatbelt. It allows the healthcare workers to release the venous pressure periodically by using a lever that releases some pressure but not all the pressure. Again, the same way with the blood pressure cup, it has one drawback that it's hard to clean and to decontaminate if blood just happens to drop on it. The key factors in a successful venipuncture, of course, is to tie a tourniquet properly in order for it to slow down the venous blood flow. The most usable, most common tourniquet that is used all over is a flat strap of uh, stretchable material such as a latex or vinyl um, tourniquet. Now we use non-latex disposable tourniquets now due to the fact that some patients are latex sensitive. Plus these are fairly inexpensive and they are disposable. So after each patient's draw, it goes in the trash can. If the tourniquet used in a healthcare facility are not disposable, they are wiped down frequently with 70% with alcohol and disinfected with chlorine bleach, which is diluted to a 1 to 10. So for every one cup, you have 10 um, contain, uh, containers of water added to it to disinfect it from any are decontaminated, should I say, from any blood or any other body fluid that might have been splashed onto a non-disposable tourniquet.
The next tool that I'm going to talk about that is sometimes available to a phlebotomist, not necessarily so in the hospital, most of the time um, anesthesiologists have this tool most of the time, but if you as a phlebotomist would like a venoscope or as we call it a vein finder, this is something that you would probably have to purchase yourself. This is something that phlebotomists don't walk around with. It is a conventional method to detect a vein for blood collection. This instrument provides a non-invasive procedure to visualize veins that are difficult to find on all skin types and to prevent vein roving. This instrument has a needle needle as well as a pediatric and adult trans illuminator to provide a non-invasive way to detect a vein for blood collection. So not only does it come in adult size, but it also comes in baby size. And if you look at figure 829, you see a venoscope for a needle needle. The AccuVein, the AccuVein is a non-invasive portable handheld lightweight tool that provides uh, improves patient outcome for blood collection by quick location of the vein. The AccuVein uses two lasers one infrared and one red that are rapidly scanned over the skin. The hemoglobin in the blood absorbs infrared light more than the surrounding tissue. The device uses this change in the reflection to determine where a vein is located. One of the most important things we have to have in our phlebotomy tray is gloves. Gloves is our number one friend. Um, and we have to use it due to safety guidelines, which were established for healthcare workers. And this is just to help prevent the possibility of acquiring any infectious disease, such as hepatitis or those associated with AIDS. These guidelines include the use of gloves during collection of blood from patients. It is recommended that healthcare workers not use gloves with talcum powder containing calcium because tubes of patient's blood may become contaminated with this powder and such contamination can result in falsely elevated calcium values. We always have to remember that we have to change gloves between all patients. We do not reuse gloves. We do not wash them, disinfect them, or reuse them. We throw them away after each patient's use. Uh, latex gloves have proved effective in preventing the transmission of infectious disease to healthcare workers. But being that most patients are latex sensitive, we have now gone to the nodule gloves for use which are non-latex gloves. Antiseptic, antiseptic sterile gauze pads and bandages. Healthcare workers must use antiseptics in order to clean the site where they're drawing blood from. Sterile gauze is used to help stop the blood flow and bandages are used for after we stop the blood flow to catch anything we might have missed. 70% alcohol preparation and iodine swap sticks preps or chlorhexapreps, which are used for blood cultures, are essential items for blood collection. The water's antiseptic agent should be carried with other blood collection items and used before and after collection if there is no soap and water available in order to wash your hands. Now we'll talk about micro collection equipment that is available for our use for when we have patients who have very fragile veins and we can't do a normal venal function. Um, 
Skin puncture, blood collection techniques are used in adults and infants when small amounts of blood can be used for diagnostic laboratory testing. And also if venal puncture is excessive, excessively harmless, hazardous, sorry, hazardous for a patient. A minimal volume of blood should be collected from adults, neonates, or older infants to avoid the risk of induced anemia caused by a large amount of blood loss due to specimen collection. In order to do a micro collection on an infant, CLIA always recommends that our penetration be less than 2.0 millimeters on a heel stick. This is to prevent any bone damage to an infant's foot. Because if we go any deeper and we cause bone damage, it causes a, you know, a baby not to be able to walk. On that. All right, the next thing that we'll carry in our phlebotomy tray is lancets and tubes, of course. Lancet blades are retract permanently after activation to ensure safety to us as healthcare workers. We have disposable sterile lancets that are retractable to a blood avoid blood-borne pathogens exposures, which should be used to puncture the skin for skin puncture uh, collection. There is also the use of surgical blades, which should not be used for skin puncture due to the hazard to not only the patient, but yourself also, because you might have backflash or backflow. There are different types of lancets that are available. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have the BD Quick Heel Lancet. These are usually used for heel sticks on infants. We also have the BD Micro Microtainer Contact Activated Lancet. And the Tenderlit Automated Skin, <clears throat> excuse me, the Tenderlit Automated Skin Insertion Device. <clears throat> this is another tool that is used on neonates also that you'll find. Another type of lancet that we use is the Garner Bio One Lancet, which is usually the lancets we use in class. Micro containers. Micro containers are usually plastic micro hemocratic capillary tubes. Most of, some of them are glass, like the ones we have at school. Ours are glass. That's why we have to be very, very, very careful with them because if they break, we lose, we risk a chance of contamination. Or and of course, as you know, if we do happen to break one, we would have to recollect on that patient. Um, they are the disposable narrow barrel pipettes used for packed red blood cell volume in micro centrifusion. Um, micro containers have their own special centrifuge. You wouldn't put them in a centrifuge the same way as you would put a tube. They also come in different colors. There's a red band, which indicates heparin coated tubes, a blue band, which uh, indicates no anticoagulants, which is the one we use in class, is the blue band. There's also a green one. There's also a green colored one. <clears throat> and there is also a black one. Plastic microcontainers are used for general uh, laboratory collections when small amounts of blood are or can be used to do certain diagnostics testing. Usually color coded according to essential protocol for blood collection vacuum tubes. So pretty much they will almost follow the same color code as an evacuated tube would also by their different colors. The different types of manufacturers who make micro containers are BD microtainer tubes, our safety field capillary 
blood collection systems, or you have the micro, uh, micro bed capillary blood collection system. You also had the cap eject capillary blood collection tubes, the bio one mini collection capillary blood collection tubes, and the RNA medical band safe wrap combo blood collection tubes. In our drawer, there is a different type of capillary collection tube that I do have available. I don't really use them. It's more or less for demonstration and to show how it works and how there's another way you can collect a capillary specimen besides the one that we use in class. There is another type of capillary collection specimen. Micro containers pretty much are PD tubes, as we like to call them. PD tubes do come in different colors, and they pretty much follow the same guidelines as a evacuated tube. The only difference is the order of draw changes, and you'll learn that uh, the order of draw changes, and you'll learn that when we do PEDS. How the order of draw goes for the PD tubes are the mini micro container tubes. All right, the B, uh, BMP Leukocheck Micro Dilution System. This serves as a micro collection and dilution unit for blood samples, which increases the speed and simplicity of leukocytes and platelet counting. This device is refillable with buffered ammonium oxalate solution, which has been tested by the CLIA. It is a disposable self-filling diluting pipette consisting of a straight thin walled, uniform bore, plastic capillary tube fitted into a plastic holder, a plastic reservoir containing a pre-measured amount of buffered ammonium oxalate solution is in there in order to get a fast result. If you work in ambulatory service or outpatient, as we like to say, your outpatient area for patients to get labs collected or labs drawn would include a specialized chair, which we call a drawing chair. There are several different types of drawing chairs, and basically a phlebotomy chair has to be comfortable for the patient must have an adjustable armrest so we can adjust it because you know some patients are taller than others so we must be able to adjust the armrest to make the com patient comfortable. Special phlebotomy chairs are available for a number from a number of manufacturers. Um, there are many chair styles and options available for making phlebotomy procedures easier and safer. Options, which includes, they can be a recliner type of chair. You can have chairs that have adjustable armrests, leg extension, neck pillows, or support. You can have a scale mount, storage cabinets, hydraulic lifts, and foot covers. If a drawing chair is not available, then we will place a patient on an examining exam table, especially if the patient ha has a history of fainting. We definitely want to put them in a laying position. For maximum safety and comfort of a patient, it must be easily accessible to either arm, meaning either side or either arm rest will adjust to fit the patient's comfortable zone. It must have um, Once we adjust the armrest, it must be able to lock in place so that the patient cannot fall out the chair if they become faint. Armrests that adjust in an up and down position to achieve best venopuncture position for each patient, because like I said, each patient is different, 
we're going to have to adjust to either be low, medium, or high, depending on how tall or how short the patient is. All phlebotomists, when you get in the field, will be carrying what we call a specimen collection tray. Specimen collection trays come in a variety of different ways. These, these specimen collection trays hold everything we need in order to make a successful and accurate venipuncture on our, our capillary puncture on a patient. This is what we take when we do our rounds as we call it. Some are, are, not some, but all are made of plastic, which can be sterilized just by wiping down with a, a chlorine solution. For home health care providers, they're usually carrying what we call a biohazard bag. And when you carry a bag, it must always have a biohazard symbol on the outside of it. So nobody will mistake it and put a pair of clothes or something that's not biohazardous in that bag. You can't use it to do blood collection and then dump everything out and then use it as a gym bag. That's not how it works when you have a phlebotomy bag or a biohazard bag. It must be lockable to prevent contents from being tampered with or accidentally contaminated. It must have a tight seal to reduce risk of infection from any bloodborne pathogens if something happens to spill by accident in it. Um, you also have different types of trays. You have a tray that has a cover on it to help protect your specimens, especially if you go in an infectious patient's room, because nine out of 10 times we cannot carry our trays into an infectious or a precautionary area. We usually have to collect what tubes we need and what equipment we need before we enter into the room. And I know somebody's gonna ask, well, how do you know what needle you need? If you need a butterfly or if you need a eclipse? Well, usually we carry both in a biohazard bag and whichever one we don't use, we um, discard it, unless it's a butterfly, because the butterfly is in a package, in a package itself. But if it's an eclipse, we usually just toss it in the sharps. Itself. Um, we also usually, if we do big morning rounds, like if you work the morning shift, which morning shift usually starts at four o'clock in the morning, most of the time we carry a cart, which is a big portable um, blood collection tray on wheels because you can carry more tubes with you as you go around and make your morning rounds. One of the things we always need to remember whenever we stocking a tray or our cart or bag, if we're on the road and we do an outpatient lab services, you always want to have a marking pin. Usually I carry around a Sharpie, those Sharpie pins. I usually have about three or four of them because usually if I go to a contaminated room or a patient who we have to put PPE on, I usually leave that pin behind once I go in that room because if we don't, we would have to disinfect that pin every time we go somewhere. Of course, we need vacuum tubes of all colors in order to collect lab work. We need safety holders for vacuum tubes. We need safety needles for vacuum tubes and syringes. Safety syringes, disposable tourniquets. We have to have safety blood collection sets or our butterfly needles. We have to have alcohol, iodine. If the patient is not allergic, we can't carry iodine. But most of the time we carry alcohol and a chlorhexaprep just in case we have to do blood cultures on a patient. You have to have gauze or sterile gauze, but most of the time we have gauze. 
Uh, bandages, of course, or Coban if your hospital or laboratory lets you use Coban. Biohazards waste containers for used needles, holders, and lancets. Safety lancet for skin punctures. Micro dilution device for finger stick blood collections. Micro micro collection blood serum and plasma separator tubes. Micro collection capillary whole blood collectors with appropriate anticoagulant additive. Disposable non-latex gloves. If you have a warming device, you can carry that also in your tray. But most of the time, we don't have stuff like that. We usually go get a clean towel from the patient's bathroom and run it under hot water if we need to warm up our area of site because the patient is so cold that we can't find a viable vein. We don't carry thermometers. That's usually the nurse's um, duty to check the patient's temperature or not. Uh, Antimicrobial hand, uh, hand gel. Like I said, if we can't get to soap and water right away after a patient, I usually carry hand sanitizer on in my tray or in my lab jacket. And of course, we have to have biohazardous bags in order to put our tubes once we collected the specimen into. And that's how you properly stock your phlebotomy tray, cart, or bag. And this concludes Chapter 8's lecture on blood collection equipment for venipuncture and capillary specimens. Have a nice day and good luck on the test.